Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Hell is for Children, a Blog Talk Radio program for and by protective mothers with your host, Geerta Franken. So what's a protective mother? A protective mother tries to protect her child or children from their abusive father by many means necessary. Yes, you can call in. Are you ready? Operation Expose continues. Five, four, three, two, one. Hey everybody and welcome to Hell is for Children. This show is on every Saturday at noon Eastern Standard Time and the call in number is 347-850-1243. And I would like to thank Bobby Biesinger from World Integrity News Network for providing us with this platform that allows anyone who has input on the topic of protective mothers and can think along with us to solutions to have their voice heard. Today's guest is protective mother Elle Leon from Australia, and she's a wonderful, persistent activist, so it's my great honor to have her on. Let's bring her in. Hi, Elle, can you hear me? Hi, Goethe, thank you. Hi there, welcome to Hell is for Children. Thank you, thank you for having me as a guest on your show. Yeah, it's a, it's a great honor to have you on. Like I, I, I shared in the introduction, you're a great activist, and um, I've seen you uh, on the many Facebook groups and Facebook pages, and you're very persistent uh, with a continuous flow of information uh, about our plight. And um, so it's wonderful to see that this kind of activism is happening all around the world. And one of the reasons for this show, Hell is for Children, is to show the audience that you know, we, we show a lot of um, guests from the United States that are dealing with a corrupt family court. And, you know, I'm in the Netherlands and the same thing is going on here in Europe. And um, so it's my great honor to, to have you on and share with us what it's like to go through the corruption in uh, Australian family court. So I would like to start with your particular story. I understand you haven't seen your daughter in five years. How did you end yeah. up in that situation? Um, basically, because I reported abuse, my daughter's abuse. I was advocating for my daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I came up against was that um, a system that um, does more to protect the perpetrator or suspected perpetrator um, in dealing in the cases of abuse. Um, there's nothing in place for the children. Um, what is in place is absolutely absurd. Um, untrained people, unqualified people, um, you know, so basically that's uh, where we were at at that stage. Like, yeah, my daughter was two years old at that time when she first started to disclose. I've been fighting this since 2008. Um, and I lost custody in 2010 after my daughter reported that uh, she was um, involved in um, child pornography. How did you I find out? out? My daughter disclosed and um, basically what I did was I recorded her disclosing. Um, it came out of the blue but she was just um, basically telling me about um, the woman um, and then there was women and then it became men and children involved and it was a game and cameras and the children had cameras. Um, there was twins. Children looked like her so she described them as twins. Um, and after that, it hit our local newspaper, the audio. Um, the elder people that I knew had taken it to the local newspaper and they printed a front page cover on it, um, basically because the police were doing nothing. Um, <clears throat> it was to get the, the police moving um, to do something. Um, uh, basically, after that, a... Uh, Ex parte hearing was put in place, I wasn't involved, um, everything went quiet. And 
a family report with Spoon Post. Um, so um, I'm having I'm yeah. I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So make sure you speak right into the uh, the phone. But so let me uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, so you you found out that your two year old daughter was involved in uh, child pornography just, and. Uh, she started um, disclosing when she was two years old, and it went up until she was about four and a half years old. Okay. So, and, and in that time, the father had, you know, put applications into the family court, and I was forced to give my child over every second weekend, um, you know, threatened in the family court. And the Child Protective Services, I take that you... Uh brought the case to them as well, or how did that work? Yeah, yeah basically, yeah, they were contacted or reported. Um, they did nothing. I never heard from them. They were avoiding my phone calls. They had a lot of meetings. Um, yeah, heard nothing from them. Nothing was put in place to help my daughter. There was referrals that doctors had um, put in place for my daughter to be specialists because the, the doctors were concerned. Um, and child protection held on to those referrals. Okay, so you presented all this. You presented all this in family court, and they basically um, ordered your daughter to have unsupervised visitation with her father anyway. That's correct. Wow. And then, how yeah. did it proceed from there? Um, basically, I was forced into signing an agreement, or if I would not, I would lose my child. So basically, if I didn't do that, the ICL, which was my child, all oh, the girl, I mean the girl in America, um, that in ad litem, um, certain that he would go in and, um, you know, get my child taken off me if I didn't sign. So I was sort of threatened to sign an agreement so the father could have more contact. Um, that went on when she was three years old and pursued and she kept disclosing thereafter that men were involved and other children involved in abuse in the abuse. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm looking at your story here because you emailed it to me too. And so so just to recap, you were threatened yeah. by the guardian at Leiden that you would lose your daughter if you did not do what they said and they they yeah. forced you to sign an agreement that he put together. Yeah. And they fraudulently labeled you with borderline personality disorder. Yeah, that's right. Wow. So once you had all that against you, um, the court basically sided with the father and um, yes. you had all this evidence of child pornography, yes. but the court didn't do anything to stop the situation. Yeah, and medical evidence. And um, there was other evidence too, and witnesses that were excluded from the case. Um, they'd all done affidavits. So I really basically, on my side, part, didn't have a case to present to the court. There was nothing put in place. Yet the father was, you know, was sort of one side and it was biased in the court. Um, I had no rights in there. I was stripped away. Um, it's a, it, yeah, when I'm looking at your story, it, it uh, like you just mentioned, um, a newspaper article was presented about your case regarding your daughter and the family court, and then the judge put in a place a secret hearing uh, yeah, about your case? Yes. Yeah. It was. And then about a couple of weeks later, my daughter was um, taken off me, and uh, she was put in foster care. Um, she entered foster care with a lot of bruises on her and she had no bruises when she left her home here. Um, the father and the child protection officer delivered my child to the foster care home. So this is interesting because they didn't, uh, the judge didn't give custody to the father. No, no. They put her in, uh, child, in foster care after they took her off me. Um, and placed her in foster care for a couple of weeks. And then 
to give them straight to the father thereafter. Okay. Wow. So you were labeled as having uh, borderline personality disorder, and you were lab- labeled as delusional and mentally ill for believing your child's disclosure about sexual abuse. And this was all fraudulently concocted by this guardian at Leiden, and your daughter was placed in foster care, and then after that with the, with with her father. Yes. Yes. It was the, um, the court report writer that uh, I think on one one of his questions that he concocted, um, and basically Crystal Ball untested the theory, and that's why my daughter was taken off me. Wow, and is there was there any way for you to to go to a you know psychologist or a psychiatrist and like counter this nonsense? Yeah, there was counter evidence that it wasn't used. My lawyer didn't use it. Why not? It seemed to me that they were all working in together. You know, mm-hmm. there was just it was just awful. It was a nightmare. Yeah, unfortunately, I have been through this too, so I can relate to uh, what you're sharing and um, what we have found out, and most of us protective moms, as you are well aware of, that um, a lot of these lawyers that will take our cases will, you know, act like they are going to help us, but in fact, they're just out to get paid. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, um, how much did you uh, end up spending on this this particular lawyer? Oh, look, I just spent heaps on it, heaps. Of, just the money, you know, it's just awful. So here you are, like in court, you're not believed. Your own lawyer is not even presenting evidence that you are psychologically perfectly fine that there are no mental disorders or illnesses and that evidence is not submitted it's not looked at and here you are losing custody to the father who you have evidence of and even medical evidence of uh, sexual abuse of your daughter is that correct all this yeah it was just it was just evidence, evidence, evidence. It was just ignored, you know, and it was covered up by the court and um, child protection. And, uh, and so, um, I'm taking. Um, um, uh, did you, I take it that you um, appealed this? No, 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 I didn't. No. As long as I'd seen what went on in the family court, there was no use of feeling it anyway because of basically what they did. I ended up not mm-hmm. trusting, them, trusting them in the end. You know, right. what had been put through as a mother, you know, protect his mother and that, yeah. So you have not been hurt, but your daughter has not been hurt either. Is that correct? No. no nothing was put in place, nothing at all. And it, it because goes, it's the same pattern with all protective mothers, mm-hmm. you know, it's the same pattern in their children. How old is your daughter now? I'm just about 10 now. Okay. So we have a situation here where basically the judge has ignored evidence. They have ignored all the witnesses. They have ignored all the, um, the your uh, evidence about you they have uh, not talked to your child CPS has not investigated your child and no, no. are you allowed to uh, what what's the, what has the family court uh, told you after this are you allowed to even talk about your case or what's the deal with that um, basically no I guess I'm gagged about the case but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's what it does, really. Yeah, and you're on you're on under a pseudonym, so uh, they can't ever go after you for this. Um, but basically, um, how how does the court? Do you have um, freedom of speech in Australia? 
Uh, yeah, we do. <laughs> We're meant to have. But, um, no, we don't when it comes to family court or child protection, really. We gag. Even if there's injustice, you can't speak, speak out. Wow. So... Mm. Um, that means that uh, you're probably not the only one in Australia, I'm going to assume. That's right. Well, there's many, many, many. On national state level. Because uh, cause now you, you have not um, had any contact with your daughter in five years, is that correct? That's right, yeah. And basically, let's see. First year we had um, spasmodic contact. Well, it depended on, you know, it was sort of when she was taken, it was sort of like an hour, and that was after a seven or probably, probably a fortnight after she was taken from me. I hadn't seen her. Um, all my older children hadn't seen her. Like I've got four older children, adult children, so they were, you know, denied contact as well. Especially her brothers, they never got any contact at all. But they seem to give my um, 15 and a half year old daughter at the time um, contact. So it was my daughter, my my other older daughter, and my mm-hmm. girls were given contact. But my sons were excluded from that contact. So basically, it was as Maudie probably sent her probably on top in 2010, 2011, probably four hours all up. Um, and after that, thereafter, we were given two um, weekday phone, phone contact, and um, that was um, severed by the start in 2012. Basically, um, my daughter was trying to like, explain how, how she was going to run away from me. Um, yeah, basically, so saying that daddies hasn't. Um, Daddies get what they want, but mothers and children don't. So that was the message my daughter's been given now from the family court, given her to her father. All custody, but children don't have rights, neither do mothers. Children don't have rights, and neither do mothers. Wow. No. And uh, wh- no. wh- so, uh, uh, you're talking about family court, but I'm going to assume that in the Constitution, the Australian Constitution, do you have uh, rights as mo- as women at all? Yes, we do. We do. I've never got that on hand, but yeah, we do. <laughs> For me, yeah. So we don't. And how about children's rights? Do you have children's rights in your constitution? Because uh, that this, we're dealing with the same issue here in the Netherlands um, that, you know, um, unlike the United States, um, we have rights as women within the constitution, but um, those, those rights are consistently broken uh, and children yeah. don't have any rights uh, in our constitution, which is something I'm also um, fighting for to get that uh, yeah. established, yeah. you know. Yeah. Because then uh, we can take we can, we can hold these family uh, court judges responsible and accountable for um, violating the constitution, right? Yeah, which they should be. Yeah, right. So, um, in, is there any way that you can fight the court on constitutional violations? Have you looked into that, or has anyone that you know been successful in doing something like that? As far as I know, no, we haven't been. Um, but we have got another um, organisation coming in, and that's um, Natural Justice. Um, we've got an um, organisation called National Child Protection Alliance in Sydney, um, and they'll be presenting a case to them in this year in August in Sydney. So we have our protective mothers. They'll be um, putting their case forward to them. So hopefully something will come of that. So you, once you uh, found yourself in this situation, you basically became an activist for protective mothers and children's rights, correct? Uh, no, no, I was an activist before that. Um, okay. On, yeah, I was on Facebook before that. And became an activist. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so tell us. Tell, tell, uh huh. 
I basically can you, started off can, in this group. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I basically, yeah, basically we started off in a group called Knowledge um, for Mothers Going Through Family Court. Um, and we had a lovely lady called Joy Hope that was um, there and supporting mothers and advising them. But, um, you know, it's what it's gone into what we are in now. You know, mothers are losing their children, you know, in huge numbers here. And um, we had shared care provision, um, but that made no difference because the judges are basically doing what they want. Family court judges are basically doing what they want in their own courtroom. You know, that hasn't changed. Mothers are still losing their children or children are still being forced into um, contact with very volatile men or pedophiles or suspected pedophiles, you know, or fathers. That's what's going on here in this side of the world. <laughs> so you, I, I take it um, that these uh, this, these groups that you're in, that there are um, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of mothers in these groups um, mm-hmm. trying to figure out what to do. Right. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. There's no support. We have no support. We have no funding. Um, we have mothers are basically left on their own. You know, and some, you know, a lot of times. They have got family support, you know. Once you lose your children, people often think, well, they believe that the mother's done something wrong. But they basically haven't lost friends and lost their family. So we're left on our own, basically, without, you know, and then, you know, we're not with other mothers and realise that, you know, you're not the only one going through this. Um, We've basically got each other to support, try and support each other and still go through our own, our own. You know, um, suffering. Not easy. And I, I can, I can relate. Uh, and I, what you are describing about the Australian situation is um, very similar, actually, as to what's happening in oh, the American right. situation. Yeah. It I seems like. Yeah, it seems like these family court judges do uh, whatever they want, and they are not oh. held accountable. They are not; uh, their actions oh. are not okay. supervised by any, um, uh, you know, judicial <laughs> commission. It's That's they're right. like a run amok. Right? That's right. It's not only family court judges; it's anyone who works within family court. They're all um, not held accountable. Yeah, that's the real problem, right? I mean, that's what we're dealing with. And, I, you know, what you're describing is that there's going to be a big meeting of Australian protective mothers in Sydney um, in coming August, yes? August, yeah, around August time, yeah. And so so that would be a a good um, opportunity to brainstorm uh, as to how to hold these family um, court judges accountable uh, in their affairs. Yeah, that's right. Hopefully. Yeah, I would think, um, and this is one of the things that I've discussed with other guests uh, from other countries as well, particularly in the United States, um, where I suggested, you know, approaching people in Congress or Parliament. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we've done that here. It, it um, doesn't do any good. <laughs> There's a lot to turn blind eyes, you know. It's just being family court is, a, is really, really protected. You know, no one wants to deal in that area. <laughs> mm-hmm. That, yeah. So we've been around. I've worked with um, politicians in in our state twice. Um, but the children, anyone who works again, anyone who works in family sports, they're children and not held accountable for accountability. You know. So they're not willing to look at uh, at the cases, and I, I take it that um, that you all have bundled your cases in war- one huge document or a, an archive that you present to them, or yeah, yeah, just not as, as in a huge bundle. You know, it's all presented, all our cases are presented, and evidence. Okay, um, so. Th- 
so the policymakers are not interested. Why do you think this is? Do you think it's a financial interest in keeping these cases going? Oh, technology, yeah. Technology. All I know is that the things they should in family court because they work in that area. And I've I've kind of followed the Australian situation uh, through what's being shared on Facebook, and I see um, I've also watched some YouTube um, movie clips on this, and noticed that um, CPS is really removing uh, a lot of children from their parents. Uh, right? Is this correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um do you have any numbers? Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. There's more incentive with the mm -hmm. um, funding. So they get more funding um, for each child. And any child that's a disabled child, there's even more huge funding. So there's more incentive to take the child to to, to you know, give them back to their family or try to put well, the stuff into the word, a new Yeah, back to the family. So there's more money there to take the child and keep them in, in, in um, group homes or fostered out or even adoption. Yeah, that's the impression that I got that the adoption industry in Australia is huge. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I mentioned. Yes, I mentioned this on the uh, uh, on my website. If you if the listeners go to www.freejasmine.com and that's spelled F R E E J A S M I J N dot com, freejasmine.com, and you click on the reflection button in the top navigation of that website. It shows a picture about Australia, and it says Australia is currently removing more children per head of population than other Western nations. And it shows that on a population of 22 million uh, Australians, there are 50,000 children in care. Uh, quite amazing, quite quite a huge uh, number. I know here in the Netherlands um, we have a population of 17 million uh, inhabitants, residents, and they remove um, 20,000 children uh, a year on average. So we're we're up there with you guys. Um, yeah, very big enough. It seems to be, like you said, an industry um, where child protective services and the foster care industry uh, makes money per child that is removed and per child that is placed in one of these state facilities. Um, is is that the incentive that you see in Australia as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, no incentive so, to keep family together nowadays. And when you uh, and the women that you um, the moms that you meet in the organization uh, in August, are these all mothers who are fighting abusive fathers, or are these also um, mothers who are fighting CPS, or is it both? Um, no, both family court. Mhm. Mm family court just expose what's going on. Basically, all that. Our stories are basically the same, um, yeah, and different ranges, pedophilic, pedophiles, um, abusers, you know, fathers, you know, basically just fathers are getting custody of their children, and the children are yeah. motherless, so it's basically the same pattern, you know, basically what's happening in, um, all over the world. Yeah, it's... It's important for me. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, basically that's the issue. The, the core issue is the um, male entitlement. It's 
seems to be that men seem to get what they want throughout the system, you know, and it's advertising men all the fathers, you know, to get the children. So funding and advertising where there's nothing, nothing for mothers at all. Yeah. So what the uh, in the United States there's the the fathers' rights groups get federal funding. Is this this is what you're saying that that's happening in Australia as well? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, there's programs in child protection where they pro, uh, there's funding to um, you know encourage fathers to be fathers of child protection. So there's funding there. There's funding funding all around basically. Yeah, the fathers get funded, but the mothers do not get funded. And that creates, right there, creates uh, inequality. Um, and like you said, it's a male entitlement agenda. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're saying this way. So in um, the United States, some um, academic research has been done around this topic and um, I know that um, uh, Dr. Phyllis Chesler actually looked into the uh, the rates at which this is happening, and she um, looked at a lot of data and concluded that 82% of uh, abusive fathers get granted full custody of their children. Um, has any of that type of research been done in Australia? Um. I haven't got them on me. The census, I believe, in 2011, probably 2010, 2011, um, I think it went up to 18%, which was around 86 but I'm not sure if that's child protection and family calling. No, we haven't got statistics here. No statistics are taken down, basically. Or pets. Um, so, yeah, that's that is something that I would um, suggest that when you meet the other protective moms in August, to uh, approach someone who you know has uh, some some level yeah. of uh, academic degree yeah. in this particular uh, area of uh, you know in this particular topic. And then have them execute uh, this research by gathering data, uh, because any yeah, policy makers. Is... Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there there is data there, and I think National Child Protection Alliance has data. You know, but I haven't got it on hand here to sort of say or give it out. So I haven't got that statistics on me. At the moment. It's the. But uh, if they go, if people go to the website, maybe they can uh, find the information there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't got that link. But on family, like I'm saying, family court and that, they don't keep the statistics of how how many children are, you know, fathers and yeah. So I'm just, uh, I'm 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 here on Google, and what I'm doing here is I'm. Uh, Typing in National Protection Alliance Australia. Is it National Child Protection Alliance or is it National Protection Alliance? National Child Protection Alliance. Okay. So um, National Child Protective Protection Alliance, the website's uh, name, the URL is ncpa.org.au So for people uh, who want to get uh, information uh, about this particular topic as well as the uh, upcoming gathering in August in Sydney, um, they should visit that particular website and um, it states, you know, um, what the mission is of this particular organization and um, you know saves the right of children and young people to be protected from harm and exploitation that's that's a great statement because um, children yeah. get yeah. exploited by family court basically yeah. now let me ask you about Australia and um, 
the United Nations is um, does Australia has Australia ratified the UN Nations Rights as a Child Agreement? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Do they have that? And have they signed on to the optional protocol of that particular treaty as well? Do you know? No, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't got that information. Yeah, if th that's that would be something that I would uh, advise you to research. Um, the way it works is all countries that are um, have ratified the UN Rights of the Child Treaty, uh, if they also have ratified the optional protocol, that means yeah. that you as as that. that if they have signed on to the protocol, that means that you as an individual can file a an official complaint with the United Nations. Yeah. And when you do that, um, it's a good idea to collect all these cases, which your organization already has, uh, from what yeah, you've told me. That's what, yeah, that's what's going on in August. Okay, so that's something that you're also addressing in August. Yeah, that 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 all go to the United Nations. Yeah. Wonderful. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. That that that's is the way to yeah. go because then the yeah. United Nations will look at the pattern of of uh, of all these cases and they'll have to conclude that what's happened to you and your daughter that it's also happening with a lot of other mothers and children, and then they yeah. will uh, have to look at it. And do something, <laughs> you know. In the case of uh, Marion, I don't know if you've listened to the show that I had with Marion Wilharter. Um, she fought Denmark. Uh, her child was taken to Denmark by uh, the abusive father, and she fought Denmark through the United Nations. Um, she did it on the uh, Convention of Discrimination Against Women. And not only did she win her case, uh, because she was able to show a pattern uh, by submitting yeah. all the other reports, they actually now Denmark now actually has to um, change their rules and regulations um, regarding mothers and children and children's rights. So that's yeah. great progress. Oh, excellent! Very good. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that I would suggest um, for for your organization to to check out because I'm I'm taking your part of uh, of the of the alliance uh, organization. Yeah. So that's the, that would be the way to go. Um, it, now, if the United Nations uh, Rights to the Child, uh, if the optional protocol has not been ratified by Australia then you should um, try and see what other treaties they have where you where they do where they have signed on to optional protocols you could for example look at yeah you could look at other treaties such as um, the United Nations uh, treaty against uh, torture and all forms of inhumane degrading and cruel treatment it's another one um, yeah. Because um, I know that in the two cases where um, the UN has been uh, fought on these issues, the, the, U, the United Nations actually has uh, stated themselves that um, taking children from mothers uh, in this fashion is a form of torture. Yeah. So... And I can I have a uh, an amicus brief that also states this that was submitted in these uh, particular United Nations cases that I can share with you, um, so you can um, add that to the petition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. So this would be a way to go, but it's a lengthy procedure, unfortunately. And it can take several years um, before they uh, accept the petition and look at the petition and make their conclusions. That is the, the downside of the United Nations process. Yeah. It's very lengthy. But I think yeah. in general, when we discuss these international cases, I think for all listeners, um, 
to the show right now. Uh, if you are all over the world dealing with this, um, you need to look at the United Nations of your particular c country. Go look it up. See what uh, treaties your country has ratified and what optional protocols they have ratified. Without the optional protocol, you can't basically do anything. Uh, they have to have the optional protocol ratified in order to actually um, submit the petition on behalf of individuals or several individuals. So um, that would be general information that I would like to give everyone. Um, I looked at the United States. The United States has not ratified the optional protocol uh, under the United Nations uh, Treaty of torture, unfortunately. Um, so that's an issue. The United States basically hasn't signed on to almost any of the optional protocols. So um, the United States has a long way to go uh, fighting for their rights. Um, they don't have constitutional rights for women and constitutional rights for children either. Um, it sounds like Australia is in a better position in that regard uh, for you guys, that you have some yeah. constitutional yeah. rights at any. least. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Not the pickup and we stop them, but it's not working. <laughs> not working right, it's, so. it's not implemented, yeah. right? So yeah. then, and, so, and this is what we're all up against. Yeah. Yeah, so the the Constitution is uh, the, uh, has the uh, rights of the child, uh, the rights of women at least in your in your Constitution, but then they don't do anything with that in family court. And wow. um, so I don't know what you feel about this, but one of my suggestions is for um, family court basically to be abolished and all these uh, child abuse cases to be handled in criminal court with jury trials. Um, yeah. so, so that's uh, one yeah. of the options that I kind of want to put forward in the sense of uh, something that maybe um, you all can discuss as well um, yeah, in August. Cool. There needs to be a definite lot, lot of change in the system, that's for sure, for helping support children with abuse. But, you know, there's nothing in there at all. There's time. It definitely needs to be taken out of family court, that's for sure. Yeah, it's um, it seems to be a like you said, it's happening worldwide. It's it's a pandemic for sure. And I, uh, yeah, I wrote a piece about it, um, um, basically stating that uh, worldwide protective mothers are losing their children to the abusive fathers of their children uh, at rates that have reached <clears throat> pandemic proportions. Yeah. And um, in the United States alone, there are an estimated 2 million protective mothers. Um, and like I said, that would be something to uh, try to get data on in Australia. How many of their, uh, how many protective yeah. mothers there are, you know? Yeah, well, I think Braveheart, Braveheart did um, Abby project, and I think they got over twenty thousand um, applied to do the survey, Abby project survey. So there's about twenty thousand there, or more, or more. 20,000 or more, and that would be per year, I would su suggest. Oh, I, don't know. I would assume. No, that was just the project, you know, that people applied for, but there could be more, you know. Yeah. Oh, there were 20,000 involved in the project? Yeah, over 20,000. So um, there, is, wow. there is data there, but just people, you know, that it, it needs to be, can be presented, which I would would be. Wow. So that's, uh, it sounds like you uh, all are organizing really uh, well in Australia. It's coming together. Yeah. And yeah. that's very encouraging. So, 
Yeah. Are there any uh, Facebook groups that you um, would recommend to listeners if there are protective mothers in Australia that uh, need support? Are there any particular Facebook groups or uh, yeah. other yeah. resources that you would recommend? Yeah, well, we have mothers who want our children back. Are you? That's one group. Mm-hmm. Um, I manage a couple other other groups and a couple of things, but yeah, um, basically that one would be the best one to go to. Um, I'll provide you with a link. That one. Mothers who want our children back, AU. So uh, I know that's a closed group. Um, so how do they? How do um, people get in then? Do they contact you, or, or how does that work? Yeah, just send me a message through Facebook or contact through a cell phone. Can pop them in. Okay. All right, so all protective mothers in Australia that are listening right now, if you need support, please uh, befriend El Leon, and it's spelled E-L-L-E, last name L-E-O-N. Befriend El Leon on Facebook, and she can then uh, add you to the uh, Facebook group that's called Mothers Who Want Our Children Back, AU. Okay. What's that? I can provide them with a link and they can send in a request to the group. Mhm. Yeah. yeah, and that uh, that would help. Uh, and then you can also uh, contact um, the website that I just mentioned, uh, the Alliance uh, website, the National Child Protection. Protection Alliance uh, dot org ncpa dot org dot au so there's a, a cont- there's a contact us uh, link on that website as well um, and you can see um, contact information about the uh, gathering that's coming up in August. Um, so I would recommend everyone to get in touch with them and uh, continue to organize. Um, that sounds like a really um, good way to come together. It's good that you all have one organization like that uh, to bundle yeah. all the uh-huh. uh, initiatives. Yeah, that's great. We'll also have in America the, the Women's Coalition um, and Cindy G. Mads. That's another good organization to connect up to as well. Yes, the Women's Coalition is an excellent organization for uh, any of our listeners right now um, all across the world uh, because the Women's Coalition is an international organization. a coalition for um, any protective mother who is dealing um, with, um, you know, entitled, vengeful fathers who take uh, our children through family court. Um, and if you go to their website, uh, womenscoalitioninternational.org, um, you can see that uh, we have formed a movement together um, that's working on these issues worldwide. And um, they just had their first meeting, and it was streaming live uh, on their website. Uh, if you go to their website, womenscoalitioninternational.org, you will see the recordings uh, of the live stream that happened um, a few weeks ago. Uh, so please uh, listen to those um, live stream recordings, take a look at them. You'll see uh, the organizer of that organization, Cindy Dumas, as well as her son, who was a victim of family court abduction. And and they are organizing really well. They have a great social media campaign. Um, They also organize court watches for any mothers who are uh, up against uh, upcoming court cases. If you have a court case uh, coming up, they'll organize a court watch 
And then we all call the judge and email the judge and uh, make sure that you are not alone in that courtroom um, and that you are presented with thousands of us, uh, which is really important. Well, let's take a little uh, musical break, and then when we come back, we'll um, continue our discussion about the Australian situation. So I'll put you on hold a little bit, Elle, and we'll see you on the other side. And we're back with Hell is for Children, and today we are talking to Elle Leon, and she is a protective mother from Australia. Her daughter was taken from her five years ago uh, on um, bullshit charges about uh, mental illness she was supposedly ha- having, and she's already has evidence. She tried to have evidence submitted to the court. Um, that there's nothing wrong with her. She had herself um, examined by um, psychologists and psychiatrists, but the court doesn't even want to look at that, and the court has not facilitated any contact between her and her daughter in five years. And the father is an uh, identified child molester. Elle has submitted evidence to the court of pedophilia, And uh, it does not matter. She has lost her daughter anyway to um, uh, to the father of the child. And uh, this is where we are. And Elle has been explaining to us that this is happening uh, all over Australia and that thousands and thousands and thousands of mothers are coming together and organizing um, and that they have an organization called uh, National Child Protection Alliance. Um, and I mentioned the website uh, already in the previous hour. Um, so that would be an organization to get in touch with. So um, that uh, they are going to be meeting in August to talk about ways to um, fight uh, this evil that is happening in family court in Australia. And as I'm listening to you, L, it sounds so much like the American uh, situation. Do you agree with me? Yeah, it's exactly the same. Exactly the same. No difference. No difference. No, yeah, exactly the same. It, it it's it's almost like uh and this is one of the things you know i've i've been try i've been writing about this because I'm, I'm looking at all these cases from all over the world and i see the same pattern um in so many different countries is that something that you uh have also found in the years that yes, you have been yes, an activist yes. down to the how many how much time it is um a mirror image even um Marley McLean, Marley McLean, her, her story is exactly, you know, when I read Marley's, I was just like, wow, you know, just exactly what I went through, and a lot of protective mothers here have gone through in Tasmania. Um, so. Now, Marley McLean, um, is she also Australian? No, she's American. Oh, okay, she's American because I I can't keep track yeah. anymore. I've I have like two thousand uh, protective mom friends yeah. now, and I'm just having a hard time keeping up with. But I have I know that she wrote a book called uh, prosecuted, uh, prosecuted but not mom. silenced, That's and you can get it on Amazon, right? That's all. Yeah, she's a wonderful activist as well, That's and. Um, Yes, she's also part of uh, Mothers of Lost Children. Um, there's been uh, a demonstration as well uh, in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago uh, by uh, Mothers of Lost Children where they protested at the White House about uh, what's happening to protective mothers. Um, and, you know, like, like we're, you and I are talking about today, it's really happening worldwide. 
Um, so let's uh, continue talking about the Australian situation. And um, what I find really alarming in what you shared with us is that all these gag orders are placed on the mothers so they can't uh, speak about their cases. And this, this pandemic, this, you know, the epidemic in Australia is therefore hidden um, because then you, you can't approach the media either about uh, this situation. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. But the media is also gagged as well. Um, if they report, they, I think they 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 have a gag order and they're fined huge money or um, threatened with prison. Right. I saw one no, article. Uh, yeah, there's one article that you um, linked to me. It's uh, in the Advocate, uh, theadvocate.com.au, and it's an article called "Mothers Labeled as Delusional by Courts." Um, it states that the courts are giving alleged sex abuser fathers custody of their children in Tasmania. And the mothers uh, are stating that um, they are declared mentally ill or delusional and that they are dangerous parents. And this is according to Professor Frida Briggs, um, who is a former Scotland Yard child protection officer uh, who investigated the situation in uh, Tasmania. So... um, so this uh, particular um, Scotland Yard child protection officer, this Professor Frida Briggs, is wonderful for, for coming in and uh, investigating the situation in Tasmania. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, academics uh, who are listening in, uh, right now about this situation in Australia are uh, launching um, research So we have more data in Australia to present to Congress about the situation. Um, And, you know, one of the things that I suggested in previous radio shows to protective mothers who are listening is if you have a gag order uh, and you don't have any visitation uh, with your child as it is, then you might as well start a website about your story. Um, because what else do you have to lose? Think about it. That's right. That, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And as long as you don't uh, include the father's last name and you change the name uh, of, of, of the child on the website, um, there really isn't anything um, that you are doing that's uh, illegal in that sense. And as we already discussed, it's your constitutional right to have freedom of speech. Um, so these gag orders can also be uh, fought in court. Um, and that's something, you know, you can, for example, file um, a civil grand jury civil complaints uh, about these gag orders. So you yeah. you all can talk about this more. You know, these, these gag orders need to be lifted. Um, but the more websites that protective mothers make about their cases, uh, the more we can all link to each other's websites and share that via social media, um, the better, the better the chance for change. Um, it's really important in my view, not to stay in that state of fear, uh, the control that's happening by these male supremacists, as I call them, is uh, happening through fear. So they want you to be afraid. They want you to feel paralyzed through, you know, the post-traumatic stress that we all suffer. And um, the the reaction we all should try to have is the opposite um, by not accepting the fear and uh, going full force forward by exposing what's going on, the human rights violations that are happening um, with mothers, with the children. Um, it's not going to change if we don't all massively step forward uh, as one uh, group, as one front, uh, so to speak. Um, would you yeah. agree with that? Uh, I agree. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. 
And then, you know, when you have, when you want to discuss, uh, when you want to have, get personal support, there are closed and secret Facebook groups where you can, you know, share details about your particular case and, uh, and get support from other moms, um, physical support, uh, presence in the courtrooms, for example, as I just mentioned with court watches, but you can also support each other emotionally, um, spiritually, psychologically, <clears throat> and then um, that helps also to strengthen your uh, belief in change and coming forward um, and trying to make that change happen. So uh, that's definitely something that I suggest all protective moms around the world to do. Uh, make movies about your case, uh, upload them on YouTube. Uh, even if you do that by not filming yourself, um, uh, but at least getting your story out there in whatever way, shape or form and sharing it via social media, that is the way to uncover this hidden pandemic. Yeah, so as we left off, when I, I got that audio interference, I was kind of explaining to the audience how fathers um, started organizing in the early 80s or so um, and started organizing to get their rights met in family court and that they have gotten federal funding for their efforts and that they organized so well, in effect, that their rights have now are now trumping the rights of mothers and children um, worldwide, um, and uh, to such a degree that uh, mothers and children have no rights whatsoever anymore. And um, we're not believed when we talk about abuse, whether that's domestic violence, child abuse, uh, ch um, child molestation. Um, it's not investigated in court when we offer the expert evidence. Um, it's ignored and the children are placed with the abusive fathers. Um, and like you mentioned, in Australia, it's about 80% uh, of abusive fathers who get uh, full custody of their children. And in America, it's 82%, so that's very close. Yeah, very close. Yeah. And um, so, um, yeah, that, so the way it, 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 it goes down is these abusive, vengeful fathers, they act in collusion with the uh, federally funded fathers' rights pro-abuse industry, uh, as I call it, to steal children from their mothers in order to continue their domestic reign of terror, in order to avoid child support payments and to continue to abuse and molest their children. Um, because much, if not most, child pornography is created by fathers who have full custody of their children. And uh, protective mothers who have lost their children are financially destroyed trying to litigate their cases. And they're often ordered to pay a huge amount of child support or the, even the attorney fees for the fathers. And when they can't pay it, um, they often get incarcerated. Um, and this is what's happening in Australia as well, as, uh, as you shared, right? The, the mothers um, get jailed. Yeah, yeah. Basically through the Hague Convention more than anything. Um, and the mothers are found they're basically put in prison um, or threatened with prison, especially with the gag orders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be... <laughs> That would definitely be something to fight uh, in the Australian situation as well as in the American yeah. situation. The gag orders are yeah, unconstitutional. Absolutely. So, absolutely. and we need some uh, some lawyers who are willing to step forward and to uh, fight these gag orders, um, you know, and uh, do this pro bono. Because uh, think about it, uh, yeah. for all the lawyers who are listening right now. Um, you know, you there. This is you can make a lot of money if you are actually going to allow these moms to step forward. Um, you know, because um, these cases can also be fought in other courts uh, where you can uh, demand uh, financial restitution. 
And, um, you know, this is how I look at it. Um, there's been mothers who have award, been awarded uh, not only their kids back, but also financial uh, restitution. So if that's the case, yeah. you can pay your lawyer out of that, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, yeah. But we've, I don't we've know. got mothers this way fighting on a limited income. We've got mothers that are single mothers on pensions, you know. What chance have they got up against? wealthy fathers or wealthy fathers that we've found um, are obtaining legalised funding. That's what's going on here in Australia, that the fathers, after the um, family report writer does his report, mothers are losing um, legal aid funding. So that's another issue as well. We've got, you know, unlimited income or you just don't get that um, legal help. And legal aid funding is cut back this way as well. Yep, and that's uh, a way they uh, they keep us down, you know. And uh, so this yeah, this would be course. another topic to, to discuss in August during uh, your gathering. Um, you know that legal aid needs to come back. In fact, um, what I personally yeah, believe. Yeah, um, another option could be to. Um, uh, get something called a custody insurance be put in place. Uh, it doesn't exist, but this is something that I've thought of myself. Like if, if there was something like custody insurance, then uh, if that was made available and made mandatory for all parents involved in custody battles, it would guarantee equal legal, legal representation for both parents. And uh, it would ensure that all court and child protective services personnel are paid an equal hourly government wage. And I'll tell you, if there was custody insurance available, those insurance companies wouldn't want all these cases to go to court because it would cost them uh, massive amounts of money. And so yeah. these cases would be settled uh, very differently. And um, <laughs> the financial incentives need to be taken out. Um, human rights and financial incentives don't mix. Yeah, yeah but male entitlement too. Because we've got that there as well, where the women aren't, aren't given their rights in family court. Like I, I can say from my experience, I walked into it, it was totally, all my rights were gone. You know, it was like a cat and mouse game and I was a mouse, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what I walked yep. into. So it's not just, you know, the money and the incentive there or anything for the insurance. It's the entitlement, you know, and the rights. Our rights are gone. We've got no rights. We've not even got rights to mother our children. Yep. Yeah, we have no rights to mother our children, and I've talked to other activists, and they say, you know what, this is nothing new. This has been happening for thousands of it's years. Yeah. 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 This it's is some religion, this is patri some law. Yeah. Right. It's it's patriarchy, and uh, it's what I call paternal yeah. fascism, uh, that's now executed that's through family courts. And yeah. uh, when when you have the guts to stand up to an abusive partner. And he then takes revenge by taking okay. your children. Um, that is a form of uh, paternal entitlement, and it's a form mm. of male supremacism that uh, is mm. unacceptable. Uh, and That's I, true. I won't stand for it. And I, you know, I'm happy that um, you're all the way in Tasmania, Australia, fighting the same battle. I mean, I'm not happy that you're fighting the battle, but I'm happy that that you know that moms are coming together and fighting this because um, yeah. it's time that uh, men evolve and uh, let go of this power trip. Um, and yeah. stop trying to control mothers and children. Um, the yeah. control game is yeah. old. It is a caveman mentality. The only way we can save this planet is by divine feminine energy and the healing that uh, results from that, as far as I'm concerned. And if men are not willing to get on board with that, we're going to continue to have war, continue to have conflict, continue to have greed, uh, continue to have human rights violations. And that is not a world that most people want to live in, as uh, I can see and I'm experiencing. And um, this is not something that only affects mothers and children. 
because our children have grown up in, and are growing up in this conflict, in this male entitlement war that's going on. And what message does that send them? What message does it send yeah. these children? You know, what hope does it give what them for a better say. world? Yeah. Yes, go yes, ahead. What my, my daughter can say that um, daddies have more rights over women and children. You know, that's the message my daughter's got. You know, we mm-hmm. need good men to stand up and, 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 and fight against these men that are doing this to women and children, defence of women and children. We need good men to stand up. Yep, and that's why we need to be uh, strong. We need to be a voice for for ourselves and for our children. So when they are all grown up and they come and reunite with us, they can see how much work we have done and how hard we have been fighting and how hard we continue to fight. Um, So they see that um, the lie that's told to them, namely that they don't have any power, that that is a lie and that they do have power. Uh, to change the world and make it yeah. equal for for all uh, for all people who are living on this planet, you know. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's definitely a, uh, it's, it's it's not only the paternal uh, entitlement agenda, but the, the, it, it well what it is it is a completely paternal entitlement agenda, and it's it, it's it's fueled by money. Um, and so, you know, the fact that fathers uh, and abusive fathers get federal funding, that, that right there needs to stop immediately. Um, yeah, because fuel, this is, fuel on the fire. <laughs> yeah, it's fuel on the fire. Yeah. It's, 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 we're, now we're funding abuse and we're making money of it. Um, that's totally sick. The way I look at it is that... Um, and I've done some research into this, an estimated $800 billion per year is generated in the United States alone from this financial kids for cash, child trafficking, trafficking revenue machine. And that's happening through the judicial system, the child protective service agencies, the foster care system, the pedophile mafia, the pharmaceutical industry, the drug trade, and the mental health industry. These are all industries making huge amounts of dollars off of the damaging uh, of our kids and and the damaging of us because they financially deplete us. Um, They leave us often homeless, um, no more money. Um, it's it's a, a war on mothers and children. The global annual amount is estimated to be around three trillion dollars. That's made by these wow. combined industries. It's more than the global weapons and drug trade combined. And it, I believe that this is why mainstream media is not covering this uh, judicial and governmental child trafficking. And that's yeah. the reason why the topic is not being addressed by policymakers, because it would basically um, put the economy um, at risk for them. Their jobs would be on the line if they would start fighting for the rights of mothers and children, which is a really sick, twisted scenario that we find ourselves in. And... Um, Another thing that I started doing is I started doing some research at why, uh, besides the male entitlements and the financial uh, incentives that are a part of this, I started looking at other incentives and I started looking at um, the Agenda 21 by the United Nations that was put together in the 1980s. If you go on YouTube and you Google <clears throat> Agenda 21 for Dummies, uh, and you go to the five uh, five minutes and 50 seconds mark, that actually is described that this Agenda 21 of the United Nations, um, that the agenda there is to steal a generation of children in order to control them through um, through education, through uh, by damaging them, basically. Um, so 
the idea is to exercise control over the next generation, which is much easier when the kids are physically, psychologically, and emotionally damaged. This, like I said, you can go on YouTube and you will hear these people that are involved in putting that Agenda 21 together. They're, they're explaining it on YouTube. It's public information that I'm sharing. It's nothing secret. It's important that people all over the world realize that this is happening and that this, um, this agenda um, has an evil intent. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's an evil intent to break the next generation of children in order to control them. It's completely sick. And we must stop that. We must um, uh, uh, openly expose it. We must openly protest this in massive amounts in order to reverse um, this trend because the Agenda 21 of the United Nations is embedded um, in all countries that are part of the United Nations, which makes the fighting the issue through the United Nations so ironic <laughs> because mm -hmm. they're, <laughs> they're going to be complaining with the United Nations about, about their agenda, right? And this is how they're now getting a wave of a backlash of their own agenda. Um, but we must do it. Um, because that's the only way we can um, show them that we, we are not accepting that uh, that intent of theirs. And there are a lot of good people out there that agree with us and not just mothers. Um, and so we must unite in fighting that particular agenda, in, 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 in my opinion. Is, is that something that, uh, that you've um, been thinking about as well? I haven't really thought about it, really. I haven't, not, not. I don't really know much about that area. I just sort of concentrate on, you know, protective mums and things. Yeah. And that's bad. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah. It's hard, you know, because once you're in this situation, um, yeah. it's it, we're so traumatized, and it's it's um, it's so hard to even wrap your mind around your own individual oh. situation, yeah. let alone yeah. the bigger picture. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've basically outlined my thoughts on this on my uh, website, um, www.freejasmine.com, F-R-E-E-J-A-S-M-I-J-N.com. If you click on the reflection, uh, basically what I've did is I looked at my own case and then zoomed out uh, to what's happening in the United States and then zoomed out even further and looked at the entire global picture and the uh, writing that I've done there has links to source data so you can see that what I'm saying is backed up with research, it's backed up with statistics um, and these are not... Um, uh, and I'm open to hearing any uh, uh, inputs on what I have, uh, what I wrote there. Um, you know, maybe there are other angles that I need to include as well. Um, all I can say that right now, um, the, like I said, the pandemic is hidden, and um, there's not only the judicial retaliation that mothers are afraid of. Um, mothers are. Um, threatened with murder. Uh, they are murdered as well. I have a whole list on my website of murdered protective mothers and jailed protective mothers. Uh, there's also a list on there with mothers who have committed suicide because they could not uh, process the loss of their children, the loss of their homes, the loss of family support. All right, and you also brought up a... You brought up a really great point that um, when mothers go through this, uh, not only are we labeled by the courts as delusional and it's, you know, the, all these nonsense uh, uh, yeah. allegations, but our environment and even our own families, uh, family members uh, might say, well, you know, this is only happening to you. And, um, yeah. you know, this, right. something must be wrong with you that you're going through this. So, um, yeah, you know, this is so you imagine if you're labelled or we're meant to be mentally or la and labelled delusional, you know, and you, you left the own devices, you know, you can't even speak support. You know, right. there's no support. Anything. So what does the mother do? You know, protect his mother too. You, 
left to dissolve on your own, basically. Yeah, but you're not alone, because uh, no, if you're oh listening no, to this no, program oh no, right yes, now, basically. then yes. you're right, you know that there are literally millions of oh, us yeah, all know, around the world. Yeah, new mums coming on board, you know, and they're all alone, you know, and isolating them to be mentally on and left to their own devices. You know, it's really insane that the family leaves them on their own. You know, don't mm-hmm. support them. They're grieving for their children, you know, they're grieving, you know. A living child, yeah. they're grieving for. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it it feels like losing a child, uh, like it feels like the passing uh, of your child, um, oh, except yeah. it, it this is almost things, worse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's no closure in our cases, so the the grieving just continues and continues. And uh, and the fathers that do this to us, they know that, you know, that's. Uh, uh, they are uh, on an evolutionary level. They are so low um, because this is the, they know that the only way they can take revenge out on us is by taking our children, and they know that we're suffering and that their intent is for us to suffer. Which is, um, you know, like I said, it's uh, on an evolutionary scale. It's like it's pathetic and it's low. Um, a, a real man wouldn't do this to the mother of their own ch- children. A the real man, a real man would never I had, I had hurt their own children. Man. I come from a, a good family and a wonderful father. He was a lovely gentleman, you know. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, no, you know, he believes that children belong with their mothers. You know, my father did. He was a matriarch, so I was blessed. You know, but when you see and get into this area. It's terrible to, to see what, what goes on and what's being done to women and children. Yep. And uh, that's uh, that would be a good message also to put out for for all the men who are listening who are not this revengeful is uh, please uh, educate your you know, your peers your male peers to not do this you know not inflict this pain on women and children I mean what are you contributing to this life on earth uh, if if you're contributing pain then how do you feel at the moment that you're going to be passing away and you look back on your life and you say, well, my contribution to life on earth has been inflicting pain on mothers and children. I don't think that will be any way, in any way, shape or form satisfying for your soul. So if you are involved with hurting mothers and children by doing this, by taking full custody, by not allowing contact, by uh, abusing your children, molesting your children, know that this will come back to haunt you in whatever way, shape, or form. You cannot get away with this hate. This hate-filled agenda is not going to benefit you or your children or the friends and future relationships of your children and future generations of your family in any way, shape, or form. So I would just, uh, yeah, I'd just like to put that out there for uh, for the abusive fathers who are listening and also for those who support those abusive fathers, for the schools, uh, for the hospitals, for the therapists, for the friends and family members of these abusive fathers. They know what's going on. They are responsible too. Everyone that allows such situations to occur are responsible for the damaging of these children. If you are have any heart, you must confront the abusive father on their role in their own children's lives. Confront them, you know, confront them and let them know that you're not okay with it because this is the only way for these men to start uh, hopefully reversing, uh, you know, their agenda. If society as a whole outcasts these fathers, these abusive fathers, and they don't get any more support, 
um, then they have to start thinking about what the hell they're doing. So that is, you know, like a, a, a moral uh, kind of way to approach it for those folks who are standing by and currently not doing anything. If you don't do anything, then you are participating in the abuse of the child. You know? So that's kind of my uh, my two cents on that. And, um, uh, you know, one of the other things in terms of solutions, and I don't know if this would work for Australian, um, for the Australian situation, but um, all child abuse cases, in my opinion, should be handled in criminal court. And this should happen through jury trials, you know, Um Maybe that is one of the things that is already on the agenda in in August in Sydney. I don't know. Don't know. No, I suppose we're just presenting our stories at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I believe um, the children need um, support through this and ex- expert expertise in, in in these areas because at the moment there's untrained people working in these areas and dealing with our children and what is in place is uh, not working for the children. It's more working for the perpetrators than the children. Yep. And uh, that's so even a really in criminal great court point. it needs changing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the judges need to be educated as well. Um there's a, a really good um, um, movie clip going around about Dr. Miller, and uh, he talks about uh, parental alienation. Now, that's a term that we usually don't use on this radio show because it's used against us in court. Uh, we are always um, accused of parental alienation syndrome, even though that has turned out to be a complete hoax and a complete false um um, theory by yeah by Richard Gardner, uh, a, a psychiatrist in the 1980s. He concocted up that uh, false um, syndrome. Yeah. Uh, but Dr. Robert Miller, he's talking about a- alienation. Uh, so if we're just talking about uh, maternal deprivation, for example, in our cases, um, he ble- he basically states that when an abusive father uh, like in your case, right, when the, the the father of your daughter is not allowing any contact between you and your daughter, that by itself is a sign that the father is a sociopath um, because no normal father would do that. It is by itself a trait of sociopathy and um, a serious malignant narcissism. Um, so these these would be the type of experts that that we need um, to testify on our behalf in court. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, definitely. So it shouldn't even go into family court. You know, I don't agree go, that it ever should have been in a civil court. This is criminal matters. Right. Yep. TV and child sexual abuse is a criminal matter, not a civil matter. It's not and, property. Um, Right, it's not property. property. Right. And maternal deprivation uh, is considered a severe form of child abuse and therefore should also be handled in criminal court. Yeah. You know? So um, this would be an issue for Parliament to take up, you know, for uh, this this needs to be uh, changed on the level of um, Congress and Parliament and policymakers. Uh, they need to become aware of this. We have a lot of educating to do, um, yeah, educating educating of the general public and educating of policymakers and educating uh we need to educate um the entire uh court system um and letting them know it's not just educating them but letting them know that we don't agree with their pro abuse agenda we are not on board with their pro abuse agenda and we will resist it by any, many means necessary as i always say <laughs> you know yeah. We did, and we lost our children, didn't we? Yeah, but now we're we're back with a vengeance. <laughs> yeah, that's right. United, <laughs> we're wide. We've even got Brazil on board now. 
gazillion mothers. Yep. And, um, you know, for all the folks that are involved in the um, judicial realm and that are gagging us and jailing us, I got one message for you all. Please stop haunting loving mothers, protective mothers, and go after the pedophiles instead. You need to put your focus on the pedophiles and set up a massive global manhunt. It's real easy to go after pedophiles. They share their material through the Internet. Um, Go after encrypted private servers. Go and uh, investigate what's going on on people's computers. Um, and sort out all these websites where pedophiles exchange information, where they set up their um, their arrangements with uh, the adults who are organizing uh, this, these pedophile rings. It's not hard at all. And this is where the effort needs to go into. The effort needs not to go into um, hunting down women and children like we're wild animals or something. Um, that's, that's how it feels like being hunted down like a wild animal. You need to go hunt down the real wild animals, which are the pedophiles. These are people that are morally corrupt and, uh, and they need to be taken down. Um, and last but not least, uh, in my particular opinion, I believe that children need to be allowed to have a voice in what happens to them. Uh, no matter what age they are. Uh, Their voices must be heard. Their experiences need to be taken seriously. And they should never be removed from their mother unless there is expert evidence presented that the mother is a danger to the child. You can't just go into family court and say, well, that mom is crazy or she's dangerous and not have any expert evidence to back that up. That is nonsense. No history, you know. Mothers, we've got good mothers, professional mothers, mothers that work professionally, you know, good loving mothers. Um, there's no history there, but they, yet they don't check the, the history of the men. They don't um, give us um, mental evaluations of men. You know, there's a lot of don't you on one side, so it's all one sided, it's a one sided approach. So in the, when you went through your uh, family court proceedings in Australia, were you uh, forced to do what's called a custody evaluation into your mental state and, and the father's mental well, state? Yeah, but basically what the the expert, the writer, was not um, trained and he's not qualified. He doesn't even, he, he holds the post-grad diploma. You know, he hasn't got the the qualifications or the expertise to diagnose anyone. Right. He hasn't got that. So uh, basically he's a quack working in the family court as an expert and is allowed to diagnose mothers with mental illness and then take their children off them, you see? Yep. And often these people are bribed as well. You know, to get a big, big envelope with cash to uh, to write it up in any way the fathers want to. Um, you know. So you're right. We need real experts that are really trained in sociopathy, and um, you know that can, can identify these malignant narcissists, that can identify pedophilia. Um, yeah. and know how to investigate um, a child on um, child sexual abuse uh, uh, symptoms. Um, many times the children are afraid to talk, to speak up, because they know they're afraid of their fathers. The fathers have threatened them with many things. Um, in yeah. my particular case, my daughter was threatened uh, with uh, withholding of food, um, other fathers will threaten to kill the mothers if the, if the child talks about the uh, the molestation. And so um, these, these experts need to be trained. Uh, they need to first build up a trust relationship with the child, which can take That's several true. months, if not longer. Yes. I agree. Absolutely. 
you know, and they need to uh, um, do these investigations with uh, not only verbal conversations, but also nonverbal testing and neurological testing. Um, and then the, the, the evidence needs to be actually weighed in court and in family court, uh, family court doesn't have to look at evidence is what I understand, um, which is bizarre, right? What's a court that doesn't look at evidence? What, what's that, you know? So here is like a stranger, a judge that doesn't know you, or your children, doesn't know anything about the situation, and they just like make some kind of opinion by what looking at the color of your hair or something, you know? Well, I thought you'd an example with my expert, the expert, or not mine, but um, the expert that we've used. Oh, he doesn't use an um, court report writer, but they call him expert. Expert. Uh. Well. Basically, he, he, he swayed towards that I was a foster child. Now, he didn't know my history. He wouldn't look at my history and my background. If, if he had a look, he would have seen that I came from a good family, <coughs> excuse me, a prestigious family. My, I've got a cousin that's a, um, held in a seat. He's an honourable minister in Parliament. Um, you know, I've got a good family background. So basically he he sort of swayed me towards being a foster child that would commit suicide. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, it, it, you know what it sounds like? It, it sounds you know, like the witch hunt in the, in the 1600s, oh, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the same kind of witch hunt where women who had any knowledge about uh, herbal treatments or, uh, you know, alternative... Um, mm healing methods, they would be considered crazy yeah. and dangerous and they would uh, be burnt on the stake. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I don't see any difference uh, between that and what's happening now. You know, um, so this this whole uh, paternal entitlement agenda, this patriarchy that we live in, um, that's really what needs to change. Um, the attitude needs to change. And uh, we're asking men to please um, respect us and respect our children, and we are equal. We're, uh, you're not better than us. We're just different. And the difference between men and women is a beautiful thing, and it should be uh, celebrated and not um, be made into a competition uh, and a control game. Uh, this is not how we're going to evolve as a human species. So um, this is, you know, uh, more of a spiritual approach in that sense uh, to the topic um, where, <clears throat> you know, I believe that uh, men, uh, all men around the globe need to evolve and help uh, their male peers to evolve um, and take, take a page out of the book of the Native American Indians who uh, – respect women and have high regards for women because Native American Indian men realize that um, women have a different source of wisdom. Our brains are wired in a different way. We can, uh, we have access to knowledge um, that men have a harder time to have access to. And Native American Indians actually go and get advice from women on how to uh, deal with certain issues uh, in their lives or, um, you know. And, 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 this, um, and I'm not saying women should be put on a pedestal. I'm just saying we should have equal respect for each other's qualities uh, when it comes to men and women because we, we, we have different qualities and uh, none of these qualities are better or worse. Um, they are diverse. And if we can pro approach it in that sense, um, then there's true equality. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah definitely. And that would also be a better example to set for our children. When our children grow up in a world where they don't um, um, deal with conflict from day one, um, they will become more, um, they will be raised in a more harmonious uh, environment, right? And this will be much more beneficial for humanity as a whole. Um, so that that's kind of where I'm coming from um, in terms of my uh, views on the topic. Um, and, you know, it's my hope that 
through the radio show uh, and through my social media campaign and my website um, that I can contribute to the healing of, uh, you know, of where we are today on the planet um, and healing towards, uh, you know, s- stopping this war and uh, sitting down together and figuring out how we're going to save the planet because really that's where uh, the focus should be on and by creating this war between men and women and making money off of our children and trying to control them, that is not the way to move this planet forward. That is not the way to move human evolution forward. Um, you know, so I'm I'm pleading for for that. I'm pleading for harmony, respect, uh, equality. Um, uh, no more conflicts, please. <laughs> and, um, you know, let's make something beautiful out of this human uh, experience instead of um, uh, putting all our energy in fighting this control game. You know, it's such a waste of this human opportunity that we have in front of us. Yeah. So, um, well, what I would like to, you know, say to you is thank you for 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 being courageous to come on Hell is for Children and share your story with us. I'm hoping that there's some way that you can get in touch with your daughter. Uh, I'm going to assume that you've tried to get in touch with her. Yeah, yeah. Have you had any uh, um, success in this regard or... Um, my daughter's in contact with her now by phone. Um, that's about it now, only just recently. Uh, that was as far as we've got so far. Um, see how that goes. That's all we've got at the moment. So it's you have phone daughter. contact? So you have contact no, with I her don't. via the phone? No, I don't. Oh. No, no, no. Uh-huh. No, my daughter has my oldest daughter. Sorry, that's my little pup. <laughs> my um, okay. oldest daughter. It's just only just Well, that's wonderful, though. I mean, at least well, she's reunited yeah. with one of her siblings. Caught him off guard. Right? Sorry. <laughs> she caught him off guard, just saying that's why she got in contact with her sister. Uh huh. Well, that's that's wonderful. That's great progress. Yeah. That's something. Yeah, it mm-hmm. is great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hear your dog in the background. Uh, yeah, and I think. The- the dog, your 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 dog agrees that there should be contact between you and your daughter. <laughs> <I'll be. laughs> Absolutely. And you know, this also brings up the issue of uh, what's happening to the siblings in this situation, in these types of situations. Um, I'm, um, because you have four other children, am I correct? Yes, that's right. They're adults. Adults now. Uh huh. Yeah, they and haven't. Seen so, that, but, you know. how has this been for them to uh, not have any contact with their sister? Oh, same as same as protective mothers. It's, they grieve. Um, you know, they my children have got post traumatic stress disorder, or my adult children. You know, trying to cope with life without their sister. It's not easy. They miss her. Yeah. They, I bet. For her, you know, because um, she disclosed to them as well, you know, and them seeing the system like it is, um, to turn them off having children. Uh, you know, yep. it's a terrible effect. Yeah, it's devastating on all of us. Yeah, my uh, Sorry, my daughter said the same thing. My my daughter once told me, she said, Mom, I, when I'm grown up, I don't want to have children because my own childhood sucks over this and uh, I would never want to have this happen to my own kids. And that just made me really sad, you know? Like, yeah, oh. I think, you know, you sort of hope that you can see the signs of it, you know, in your children, you know, and you hope your children, you don't imagine that your children will go through this, you know? Mhm. Yeah, I know that uh, mm-hmm. our parents probably never thought we would be going through this, you know. And uh, I know my mom is really upset about what's happening. Um, 
she never expected me to go through this and for her to go through this with her granddaughter. Um, you know, so this okay. is, um, you know, also a shout out to uh, all the, um, the grandmothers and grandfathers that are going through this. Um, please become vocal. Uh, please participate uh, via social media and stand up for your rights as grandparents as well. Uh, fight back. Yeah. Help us in the fight. You know, we must do this as society as a whole. Don't leave the battle to fight for the protective mothers alone. It's too hard. We're so traumatized. We need your support. And this also goes out to the aunts and uncles and sisters and brothers and all family members uh, out there. Uh, if you have a protective mother with a child who's been stolen through the courts and placed with an abusive father, please be supportive of that protective mother. Help out in any way you can, please. Do not leave this protective mother hanging by saying, well, you know, must be something that she did to cause this. Be aware this is happening to millions of mothers all over the world. Um, we are not exceptions. Um, so please be supportive. Sorry. What's that? All right, call somebody that we've heard close from the floor. Uh, flying monkeys. Cold? The flying monkeys, yes. Flying monkeys <laughs> is also a great topic. Flying monkeys are people who are working for the narcissists to uh, do their dirty work and spread lies right. and participate yep. participate in the yep. agenda of the narcissist to spread lies about the mother. Um, you know, these protective monkeys are usually people who have very low self-esteem, and who believe the narcissist because the narcissist has a lot of power and they look up to that power and then they participate uh, as minions of that narcissist. So if you are helping an abusive father uh, with the spreading of lies about the protective mother, know that you are a flying monkey. You have now have a label <laughs> and you should stop. Uh, yeah. Well, we've uh, we've covered a lot of great uh, topics, you and I, today. Um, I have one caller on hold that I want to bring in. Um, let me put you on mute for a second. And um, hi, caller. You are live on the air. Last number of your phone number are 3871. Hello. Hi there. You are live on the air. Well, I don't hear anything. Um, so well, I don't know, maybe you're... That's me, um, Coral Teal. I was just listening to the program. Oh, hi, Coral. Thanks for coming yes. on the show. <laughs> yes, it was a wonderful program. Thank you. Both yeah, and I know you you know all about flying monkeys. <laughs> yes, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in your particular case, uh you've been targeted by uh flying monkeys uh in an extreme uh, extreme ways and uh I want to do an entire show with you on this topic as a matter of fact and uh highlight um the abuse that's happened to you by uh institutionalized uh, uh religious uh organizations. Yes. The and, church um, for many of us I get letters all the time from women who um seek safety and the church and the pastors, elders, the women in the church uh surround their abuser and help take the children away. And this is epidemic, um, especially in Oregon, where I came from, from one pastor that did that to me, who also abused me. And he's doing this to other women in the Oregon area for the last 20 years. And there's nowhere to go to report mm -hmm. because these pastors um, are supported or they're under accountability to other men like them. That abusers uh, support abusers. So it's um, a very sad situation. And I'm thankful on your program that you um, addressed, um, Ellie addressed, that our family courts really should be, um, there's no place uh, for the criminal part. It's like, it's, uh, I call it intimacy discount, that the men who have battered us uh, to go to family court, uh, they are not treated in any criminal way. 
And so it's mm-hmm. somewhat like an intimacy discount. Yep. I have about uh, 40 seconds left on the show. Now, I know that there's no show planned after this one, so the, the, it might just uh, keep going. I'm not sure. But just in case uh, we do get cut off in about 30 seconds for now, uh, I want to thank you, L, for being on and sharing your story and sharing the Australian situation. Thanks for being courageous, and thanks for all your thank activism. You. It's been a real honor to have you on. You too, Carol. Thanks for... Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, and, and, you know, maybe the the program will continue to to air. I'm not sure. Uh, Here we go. One more second. Uh, like I, last week, this happened as well. Um, there was no show scheduled after mine, and so it just kept going, which is actually wonderful. We can just keep talking because uh, I believe that it will continue. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, Coral, the, the the point that you brought up, um, like I said, I want to do an entire uh, show, particularly on that, how uh, bullies are, um, you know, uh, enlisting flying monkeys and. This can be uh, take uh, gross p- proportions, um, and the mother, the protective mother, really gets vilified to the point where um, she becomes outcasted within the community. Um, it, it's very, very cruel people, uh, especially when they proclaim to be religious. And uh, uh, my goodness, you know what travesty of religion that is, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Um, and it's mostly yeah. epidemic in the fu- fundamental Christian realm, although that can um, be all all of the above. It, it's not just limited to Christianity. I mean, it can be in the Catholic Church, the Jewish, um, any of the those that um, highlight patriarchal <clears throat> religion. Right, exactly. It it, it comes down uh, to that paternal entitlement as we were discussing before, um, and whether that uh, gets executed through uh, the court or via the church or via schools or whatever uh, organization, um, the aim is the same, and that is to uh, take power away from women, and, and therefore we cannot protect our children, which damages the next generation. And the chance that this will therefore be repeated from generation to generation only becomes bigger, not smaller. You know? Yeah, but that's that the point is for sure. So um, let's leave it at this, you guys. Uh, Thanks so much for participating, and thanks to all the listeners for tuning in today uh, for uh, Hell is for Children. And I hope you all tune in again next week um, when I have another very, very special um, protective mom activist on who will share her story and her work towards changing the system. So um, thank you both. And um, I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.